um, four pilot countries in addition to Brazil. Um, there are uh, Colombia, Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. Uh, we will um, start to test some of our services and, and try to engage uh, the stakeholders from, from these countries and um, trying to find out synergies and what we can do together uh, to create win-win situations for research and innovation communities on both sides. From Brazil, we have uh, one Brazilian partner, Anpei, and the Enrich Center, which I will come uh, uh, in the next slide. And from Europe, we have uh, five partners from four European countries. Uh, Enrich Center uh, is established as a nonprofit association uh, in the last project period in December 2019 with the participation of the European Union ambassador to Brazil, Mr. Ignacio Ibanez. And uh, the center um, and the network contains various organizations. Currently, I think some somehow 50 organizations. Some of them are founding members from Europe and from Brazil. Some of them are founding associates uh, like Fiocruz, Natura, Braskem. Uh, these are the, you know, diff representing different research uh, in innovation or organizations like universities or companies. And then we have soft lending hubs or regional partners. Uh, that uh, are also involved in the association. We have project partners like my organization and DLR from Germany who are supporting the network. Uh, and we have uh, in the association uh, around 35 members from various sectors, as I said, from university to company. And 10 of them are uh, in the process of being members. And these are the current executive board members of the association uh, from Brazil. Uh, yeah, um, in the last four years, we have undertaken many, many activities. I just wanted to highlight some of them. Uh, more information, for more information, I will give you the uh, contact uh, details of the, of the you know, project and initiative and, and the center. We have uh, organized more than 50 webinars and trainings where you can watch all of them through YouTube. In, the, in our YouTube channel, we have uh, launched two innovation challenges, one internally as an initiative, and one on behalf of Natura uh, on zero wage packaging. Uh, what we also would like to put more emphasis in, in this term in the next three years is to, to increase more research to market and business to business collaborations. Uh, therefore, we have a matchmaking platform, as you can uh, see here, your Latin American Caribbean RTI networking platform, where we were going to uh, organize various uh, brokerage events and um, inform you about the open calls, innovation challenges, etc. We are going to organize, hopefully after uh, this corona pandemic is over, innovation and matchmaking tours to um, both sides. Uh, we will continue with the virtual EU roundtables where EU member states uh, indicates the opportunities and challenges when collaborating with the, with the target countries as well as digital transformation assessment. It's a self-assessment tool that we uh, put together uh, together with uh, two other enriched centers uh, from China and USA, where you can where organizations can assess their uh, digital transformation. In enriching luck, uh, we have which is different than the previous project is the thematic focus areas. We have five uh, focus areas identified: health, bioeconomy, renewable energy, sustainable urbanization, and ICT. Uh, which put emphasis on the digital transformation and industry 4.0. As you see, we will offer various innovation support services, um, ranging from knowledge sharing, community building, training, capacity building, and various networking activities. Um, that's all from my side. For more information, please um, stay tuned with us uh, and uh, be part of our community. Uh, join our, our newsletter group and follow us from the social media. Thank you very much. And I hope we will have fruitful discussions today. Thank you so much, Bianna. In the meantime, I was told that the volume of my voice was a bit low when speaking, so I changed headphones. I hope that works better now. Um, Sounds good. <laughs> good. Um, we also would really like to engage with the audience today. Um, 
and usually in this webinar uh, series or webinar situations, it's a bit difficult, but we set up a, a Mentimeter. Some of you might be familiar with this uh, already, and I will share my screen with you here. And we would all, we would invite our, uh, our guests and participants to join us at uh, menti.com. So you type in the code and you will um, find there a couple of questions on today's topic um, and some other questions. You will also have the opportunity to ask questions to the panel uh, or to the speakers. Uh, that is also possible uh, via Zoom. So you can, if you have connected via Zoom, you can also uh, put it in the question uh, box on the bottom of your Zoom screen. So I will come back to this, this Mantipole after the next one or two presentations and we see, we're see we gonna see what we have there. But for now, the, the next on the program is my colleague Jonas Bülund, who will introduce to us the Food Water Energy Nexus and maybe give us an outlook on regenerative green neighborhoods. Jonas, the floor is yours. Thank you. And, um... Thank you all uh, the organizers uh, and the Enrich uh, context uh, for having us here. I, I think this is a really interesting um, context. Um, my name is Jonas Bylund and I'm a research and innovation officer in the JPI Urban Europe Management Board. Now, I'm gonna just very briefly introduce um, a call that is, well, let's say that projects in the call are ongoing, and then I'm gonna kind of prompt a bit around what, what's coming up next. Um, so JPI Urban Europe, the Joint Programming Initiative Urban Europe is, let's say um, it's a European kind of based oriented uh, uh, network, uh, actually a network among member states, but not exclusively uh, European Union member states. Although we have close ties to the European Union, we are not actually officially under the European Union. Um, so that might be something to really keep in mind. Uh, we have, as you can see from the little storyline that we've drawn, we have uh, even nowadays more than 20 countries as full members, but we also welcome uh, member uh, countries to just join and join in for a call or something. I mean, a call for projects, not just a telephone call. We're quite happy to do that as well. Um, we're also having more than 40, uh, regularly working with more than 40 funding agencies in different ways, different programming activities from joint calls to, to also these kinds of aspects around networking, shaping innovation ecosystem aspects, etc., for urban transformations or sustainable urbanization, however you would like to call it. Um, moving a bit quickly through this, uh, a couple of years ago, around 2016, uh, I guess it was even 2015, we started working uh, together with the Belmont Forum, who is also here today with Erika. And I think she's going to have some really interesting information um, to, to share. But we started working on the Sustainable Urbanization Global Initiative, uh, as it was later called, uh, that is shaping uh, collaboration uh, around food, water, energy nexus aspects in urban areas and actually also sustainable consumption production in certain ways. Now this call um, was because this is seen as a really intricate kind of um, challenge. Three, <laughs> not least than three kind of heavy, usually rather sectoralized or siloed uh, uh, infrastructure areas, food, water, energy, but also, of course, looking at how the interaction between these uh, 
categories, how they actually play out and how to kind of shape them more into more sustainable ways in different parts of the world. So that, that's kind of a, a huge challenge in a way, uh, a huge ambition for the projects. Uh, we set up three uh, topic areas for this. So one is, of course, shaping knowledges around these interactions around the network nexus dynamics, um, indicators, assessments, etc. Uh, we also asked projects to shape, um, what do you say, the, the urban governance capacity building aspects in this, right? Uh, because that, that seems to be a huge issue in, in how to uh, treat nexus in different ways, managing it, and also looking at more, let's say, at times perhaps engineering solutions, ways to, to push these uh, systemic aspects forward by, by, by looking at, for example, uh, vertical agriculture uh, in, in urban areas, etc. Right, so just to show you the, the context with the funding agencies and countries involved in this call, um, and of course, we recognize that there are also usually quite an overlap when we, uh, when we work with Babon Forum in this, because many of the funding agencies in Europe are also uh, very engaged and, and working with the kind of global Belmont Forum situation, uh, which in a way is also very fortunate, I guess. Uh, so from that context, to move back to Europe a little bit. Um, what we're working on now is, let's say, setting up a partnership for the next seven years uh, uh, with the European Union, kind of policy lines, funding situations around uh, sustainable urban development in different ways, or, or the grand social societal challenges, you could say. Um, and in this, we're looking at now three priority areas uh, that we're focusing on. Positive energy districts uh, is one. We have for kind of mobility issues, transport, logistics, accessibility in urban areas. We have the 50 minute cities as the kind of slogan. And in the third one, in the middle one in this picture, we have what we now call the working title is Regenerative Green Neighborhoods. And uh, this, of course, uh, as a transition pathway is something that we are looking a lot to the uh, food, water, energy nexus projects, uh, not just in our project family of Suji together with Belmont Forum, but we're actually looking a bit beyond to different uh, projects that have been working with uh, food, water, energy nexus uh, in different ways, looking at how the knowledge frontiers are developing, what are the challenges on the ground, etc. Uh, and not just in Europe. This is important. Um, this pillar will kind of combine, uh, in a way, nature-based solutions, green, blue infrastructures on the one hand, but also uh, pushing new urban circular economy developments, but it closing circularities in, 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 in the cities in a way you could say. We're also looking into kind of capacity building for uh, what is becoming a thing in Europe around the downsizing uh, city donuts, if you've heard about that, Kate Ravitz uh, concept where both Amsterdam and perhaps also Brussels and a couple of other uh, cities are starting to really try to shape this concept. So in that context, we are uh, kind of looking a lot uh, and just to see that this is not just, let's say a kind of a uh, from above research or, or a policy drive, so to speak, but that this is also something that a lot of people on the street level, so to speak, are uh, really 
curious about, wishing for, desiring when it comes to greening cities, etc. Right. So there might be uh, a lot more there in the coming years from us. At the moment, just to round this off, this short little introduction, um, we do have these three kind of key areas with some notes here on kind of thematics that are involved. Um, and this is kind of where we are at the moment. This is also fluid. Um, we're developing it at the moment. This is kind of live hot matter in a way. So any interesting aspects you would like to share in this seminar, this webinar, sorry, today, uh, I'm, I'm listening with rather big ears, so to speak. And I think Johannes is doing as well. So thanks for me. And, and um, I'm really looking forward to what's following. Thank you so much, Jonas. With that, I would just like to go to the next presentation, which is by Erika Key from the Belmont Forum. Erika, you will tell us a little bit about upcoming opportunities, I believe, in the Belmont Forum and what is, what is happening on your side at the moment. Thank you very much. And I'm glad to join everyone today from the Belmont Forum's global headquarters in Montevideo, Uruguay. Uh, at the LATU offices of our member, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. So um, building off of this incredibly successful and impactful partnership with JPI Urban Europe and the Sustainable Urbanization Global Initiative, which um, was a very complex partnering, but fruitful because it is global. It brought together not only uh, their member institutions and funding, but the Belmont Forum member and partner um, funding and in-kind contributions. So um, just looking to the near future, um, these projects have already begun to generate incredible knowledge and um, sustainability solutions for urban areas. They're very active on Twitter. So I invite you to please uh, follow them. Um, they've been uh, pushing ahead even during the pandemic. And we look forward to engaging with them at our first ever Sustainability Research and Innovation Congress. Uh, it's the core dates are June 12th through 15th. Uh, it will be held online and uh, in person. And just to, yes, please, that's that's great. Advance the slide. Um, we have some excellent uh, sessions, alternative design, and marketplace workshops, etc., that are being. Um, conducted online and live streamed uh, during this Congress. So here's just a few examples, including um, a session from Pia Laborn, who has joined us today um, to, to talk, um, and others about innovation for cities, um, you know, net zero attainment, transformation, mobility, um, and democratic participation. So uh, looking at this from all different angles, and this is not supposed to be uh, a Congress where we have people talking at you. This is about people uh, meeting and working together to build collaborative action. So if you can go to the next slide, I can give you um, the link to this meeting, uh, this Congress. Um, it's SRI2021.org. And to give it even more added value, we've started the program uh, just last month with trainings in transdisciplinarity, in science communication, uh, in engaging with governments uh, to be part of a transdisciplinary transformation. And uh, we, our next SRI uh, event will be March 17th. 
And the focus is sustainability solutions from the global south. So we would very much welcome you to join that free event and hopefully you will register and uh, join us at the Congress, which will be run 24 hours a day. So you don't have to get up in the middle of the night to uh, be on Australian time. Um, I would like to move to the next slide um, because there are more than just these session opportunities there. We're also working on some added value uh, and opportunities for attendees to provide input to what we fund next. So uh, we're working with Jonas and the team on some events about systems readiness level, an innovation showcase, but as well, uh, we're looking for your input um, into the uh, priorities uh, for funding. So we will be launching Pathways to Sustainability projects there. It's the first cohort um, and an amazing global cohort that has 25% um, participation from the Global South with funding. Um, this is part of a longer term program. So we will have another Pathways call and so it's an opportunity to provide input on what that would look like. We're also developing a future leaders program, which uh, we are looking to existing uh, leadership programs for youth, early career and mid-career um, transition uh, experiences to better scope this and make it available to all the themes that we have in the Belmont Forum portfolio. We will have a second call on climate environment health and the IAI where I work will be uh, having regional input sessions uh, to ensure that LAC is uh, well represented uh, in this next call as well, we are engaging strongly in Europe, Asia, and Africa. We are in the process of scoping a migration and mobility call. Um, we have a significant number of funders engaged in this, looking at uh, a human-focused perspective on migration and mobility, particularly as uh, COVID uh, has reduced our mobility and uh, highlighted the experiences of migrants who fall um, outside governance and sometimes um, outside of uh, justice programs. So uh, be looking for that as it develops. And then most recent, as I just got off a call before I came to this meeting, is our newest activity on systems of sustainable consumption and production. We will be having an experts meeting and you are all invited to attend that. I will provide my email in the chat box. Um, this will be at the end of April. We have an initial framing of this complex system of interaction. We would like to revisit that frame with you um, and look at it in light of the changes that COVID may have um, brought in terms of priorities and needs, what is most immediate, what is attainable, and where is the interest. So um, please do join us for that event. Um, looking further down the road uh, with dates that have not yet been announced, we are also going to be exploring urban blue and green spaces and a beyond the Paris Agreement call that looks at climate adaptation. So I think all of these are relevant to the food, water, energy nexus, and our interests are global, and we want to uh, bring regions together, um, you know, uh, support transboundary uh, activity and transdisciplinary approaches to build new knowledge and meet the Belmont Forum challenge to understand, mitigate, and adapt to global environmental change. So thank you very much for um, including me today. Thank you so much, Erica. And uh, Erica's presentation is actually a perfect segue to 
the next uh, next presentations, which we actually will go into the substance uh, of the the Suchi projects or the projects which were funded from the Suchi call by the Belmont Forum and JPI in Europe. Um, before we go before we go there, I would like to again um, show my screen with you and ask everybody who's uh, joining us either on Zoom or on YouTube to uh, also join the discussion via the poll which we have set up. Um, it's very easy to, to go there. Uh, you go to menti.com and type in this code. Um, this code is also for those who are connected in, in Zoom. It's also in the chat. You will find it there. Um, so far, we have 25 participants in, in this poll. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not the best in math, but I see that we have well uh, over 100 participants uh, on Zoom and uh, uh, YouTube. So there is still way to, to improve this number. Yeah, there's more coming in, very good. Um, so we had a look at what, what cities and towns are you from? And we see that people are from um, dialing in from Montevideo, from Sao Paulo, just to, to give you a, um, some, some flavor here. Uh, Vienna, St. Pölten, Verona, Delft. So we have, you're dialing in from all over the place. That is very, very good. We also asked you, how familiar are you with the approaches combining food, water, and energy? And we can see that there's a number of participants who are quite, who know quite a lot about this, this Nexus approach, while others are new to this discussion. And that is very good. I think we, or I hope that we can shed some light here and uh, everybody learns something from this, this webinar. What keywords come to your mind when thinking about Nexus or about the food, water, energy Nexus? And we have very strong this sustainability, synergy. We have resilience, capacity building, water consumption, autonomy, industrial eco ecology. Very interesting. Very good. We might come back to, uh, to this poll later. In the meantime, feel free to use it. Go to manti.com and um, let us know what, what you think of, of the food, water, energy nexus and how experienced you are uh, with this approach. Yes, so as I, as I mentioned before, now we would go into the, into the real sub the subject or, or uh, some projects and the cases uh, which have come out of this, this uh, Suchi call. The first one is the fa uh, waste fuel project, one of the projects funded from this call. And the project is mapping and reducing waste in food, energy, water nexus in cities across three continents in Europe, Africa and South America. We will hear from Daniel Black and Esther Del Poz um, about the project. Daniel, just checking, um, shall I, I, I believe I should sh uh, share the screen, right? Um, I shared already, do you see it? Ah, I see it, yes, that works well. Thanks, Berna. Good, Daniel, then the floor is yours. Thank you, Johannes, thank you, Berna. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting us. Um, and thank you also to, to JPI Europe and to, to the Belmont Forum for the SUGI Initiative. Um, so my name is Daniel Black, and I'm, I'm sharing this with Esther Dalpoz, so I only have six or seven minutes, so I'll be quite quick. Um, I'm going to give you a quick overview of, of the program as a whole. And then, sorry, Berna, would you mind going back to the first slide? Sorry. Um, and then... Uh, talk about the Bristol Urban Living Lab and then hand over to Esther and she'll talk about the Sao Paulo Urban Living Lab. And as the title slide says there, and as Johannes has, has indicated, that our focus is on reducing inefficiencies in the urban food, energy and water systems. And it's across four urban living labs and three continents. Um, so sorry, ne next slide, please. So we have six partner countries um, and uh, uh, in addition to the four urban living labs, we have 
two supporting research partners. In Bristol, we're in the UK, we're focusing on nutrient recovery. In Rotterdam, they're focusing on scaling up of startup circular economy businesses. In South Africa, on local water purification and food growing. And in Brazil, on innovation, transition management and policy. And the support from Norway, there's a, an organization called Cicero who are providing support on economic valuation. And I, I think Talian, uh, who's on our team is, is on this call, if you have any questions for him. And the University of Santa Cruz in the US on knowledge exchange and dissemination. And next slide, please. And to, to give you more of a visual clue as to what each of the, the focus areas are, or, or each of the urban living labs are looking at, Bristol is focused in on a, on a wastewater treatment plant just outside the city. And Rotterdam on the top right is, is focused around a business incubator. Cape Town uh, and the Water Hub is located outside of Cape Town, actually in a township in the Western Cape where clean water, jobs and food are the immediate concerns. And Esther will tell you more about Sao Paulo shortly. Next slide, please. So in, in Bristol, our main partner is Wessex Water and they're a large infrastructure uh, provider. They, they supply much of the water across the region in the southwest of the UK and they also run the sewage treatment in Bristol uh, and they do that with their subsidiary company Genico um, and Genico are, are tasked with de developing innovative sustainable solutions for them as a business. We're also working with two leading experts from the third sector on food and energy and during the project, as the focus areas have narrowed, we've also started working closely with Bristol Waste, uh, at, which is the council's waste company, and Resources Futures, a consultancy based in Bristol that specializes in waste. And all of these experts play uh, a leading roles in the development of Bristol's One City Plan, which is seeking to set out a roadmap to net zero 2030. Next slide, please. So the project started with, with a very broad aim. Uh, so much of the first year and more was spent in meetings with stakeholders, identifying the key areas of focus. And on the water side, it's always been about phosphorus, uh, which is essential for growing food, growing crops. But on the energy and food side, it was less clear. Um, the energy advisors immediately narrowed in on the wastewater treatment plant site. And in the end, we ended up focusing on all three of those areas on nutrient flows through that site, which of course links to food. So next slide, please. And, and in the end, through, through many, many meetings, our, our final three focus areas are on avoidable food waste. Uh, and you can see here that, that there's a study that's been done in the UK, which suggests that on average, a family with children wastes around or throws away around 60 pounds, uh, as in pounds sterling, of food each month um, and plastics in, in uh, commercial food waste. And in Bristol, uh, there are 33,000 tons of, um, uh, of commercial food waste that goes through that site, which is contaminated with a thousand tons of plastic and the phosphorus in the water and the 166 million liters of effluent go out into the river Severn every day from the city and two thirds of the phosphorus is lost in the liquid waste and a third of it is captured in the solid waste. Ne next slide, please. So an early environmental assessment, economic assessment by the University of Bath looked at the food waste aspect specifically and the evidence showed that in terms of carbon emissions, eutrophication and air pollution, reducing food waste at source was far better than trying to recycle it downstream. Now, this is not news. This wasn't surprising to us. Uh, most people who work in this area know about the waste hierarchy, but it was nonetheless important evidence for our stakeholder partners who are looking for useful evidence to support the One City Plan. Next slide, please. And this, this challenge of upstream consumption versus downstream recycling recapture, we sought to conceptualize in a schematic that showed the nutrient flows through the Bristol wastewater site. And you can see the food waste 
plastics and sewage in the middle feeding into the recycling center, which is in the green box. I'm afraid I don't have time to, to spend any more time on this today, but perhaps if the slides are shared, you can look at it after. Next slide, please. And a, a second piece of work, uh, this one done by Cicero, who I've already mentioned, uh, this was looking at the macroeconomic impacts. Um, and what this piece of work did is it flagged a major potential barrier. Uh, it looked at the impact of food waste reduction on the food industry. And it suggested that any reduction in consumption is gonna have a much more substantial monetized impact on mainstream economic factors, such as jobs and income. And therefore any initiatives in this area may fall flat. Now, obviously, again, this, this may seem fairly obvious, there's been, but there has been much counter argument to this with people pointing out that these assumptions in the economic models do not account for the fact that people might shift their consumption elsewhere into different sectors. So instead of wasting food, for example, they might spend that additional 720 pounds per year on holidays. So one of our next tasks is to work through those scenarios, work through those assumptions and, and test those out. And then last slide, please. And so I don't expect you to, to read all this, but this is just to say all this discussion is now uh, we're trying to develop through this an emerging impact strategy. Put simply, what evidence do we already have? What more do we need? Who is interested in this evidence and why? Um, and then my final slide is just showing all the various uh, uh, organizations involved on the project. So I'll, I'll hand over to Esther now. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Esther, would you just uh, like to continue, please? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for the, the Belmont Forum and the Urban Europe Initiative for this invitation. We try to. Can you see my slides? Not yet. Now they are coming. No. Yes. Yeah. Now they are here. So nice to be with you. Um, in this pandemic. Uh, this is the Sao Paulo in Natura Lab. Uh, this is part of the SUGI uh, few ULL initiative. And the uh, Sao Paulo in Natura Lab is the name of our urban living laboratory. Um, we, we, have, um, we have our funding agencies for PESPI and my university, University of, of Campinas, is uh, a partner, is a member of Enrich. Yeah? So I am Esther Dalpoz. Uh, I am a professor of uh, agricultural economics, industrial economics, very interested in, in industrial innovation, innovation issues all my life, especially in bioenergy and sustainable food systems. Uh, I am the coordinator of the, the Sao Paulo in Natura Lab. Uh, and the, our objectives are to be an innovation-driven institution for sustainable food systems in Brazil. As you know, Brazil is a, a huge producer of, of food. Um, uh, the first one, for instance, in animal protein, the second one in soybean sometimes, etc. So we, we have been dealing with innovation um, uh, dynamics and in this case, um, we have a special area, but it's not, it's not only for this area. We, we have been investigating and creating indicators, sustainable indicators for food production in this area that is in state in Sao Paulo in the south of Brazil. You can see here the Atlantic rainforest, the, the remaining 13% uh, of, of our uh, Atlantic rainforest. This is the Sao Paulo uh, mega metropolis and our two uh, sites of investigation are the south of the mega metropolis and the Biuna city. Yeah? As you can see, this is uh, not, a, not only a, a urban area, but a urban area as uh, Jose Graziano, the, the former uh, fell for them in, Agriculture Organization Director, my colleague, always say, yeah. So here, 
at uh, our photo. As you can see, this is an agroecological plantation of greens, and you can see the, the Atlantic uh, rainforest border. So uh, we do not have only, only three helices, but four, um, four helices, because food, energy, water, and the forest not only preservation. We have a lot of, of uh, water source here. Yeah? So talking about the project in itself, um, our, our main challenge is to understand how innovation, and uh, uh, it means technological forms uh, and modes of production and organizational innovation that seems to be in this case more important than technological uh, uh, diffusion, yeah? because we have a lot of food losses uh, in this area, uh, because the, the production chains and production va and value chains are not well organized. So this is the main challenge now. Yeah? How, how this can foster the transition for sustainable food systems. So the first procedure is to map and simulate um, the, the level of sustainability of the systems, of the production systems for those uh, two pilots at the borders of the, the Atlantic rainforest. Yeah? We have been using system dynamics and agent-based tools because uh, do, we do not assume at all the uh, circular economy uh, approach. We have been dealing with uh, an ecological um, approach in which we have, of course, in the tradition of my Institute of Economics, we have been interested, as everybody here, in social and uh, environmental development too. Yeah? So we have been um, comparing five, five modes of production for this kind of food. Yeah? Here you have um, the, the four main indicators that are water footprint, carbon footprint, land, social development index and the land social development index is formed is, is, is composed by five others because as you know we have to understand if the, the food production uh, is preserving um, we have a, a strong law uh, body of laws in Brazil concerning the preservation despite of the uh, Amazonia and Pantanal have been burning Unfortunately, yeah, but we have a very good set of, of laws to, of preservation. So the, the, the Land Social Development Index is composed by how people use the, the, the land use, of course, not only um, revenues or incomes. The trophic state, uh, especially um, as a proxy of phosphorus and net, net profit index. So. We have um, in a second, uh, an integrated approach in which we can, um, we are interested in, in how to create the conditions, how to create a sustainable innovation decision making tool yeah, in which many people can use and can understand in which terms, for instance, it's better to, to have agroecological or aquaponics integration of, of production. And then uh, family uh, smallholders, because in those areas of Ibiuna and Parilheiros, we have huge producers, but we have a lot more than 5,000 families of food produce, producers. So it's very important to understand uh, uh, to have a multi-criteria set of indicators, yeah. Uh, uh, and we have here to 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 elaborate the the two the multi-criteria decision-making tool. We have more than 40, 40 institutions network working together to understand if it is better to uh, the option to have a more sustainable um, production concerning water use, for instance but you have a, a less interesting uh, net profit for families, yeah, income for, for families. Yeah, so uh, this is the main uh, rationale of the, the, the two. And- uh, Esther, you have two more minutes. Yeah. 
So uh, we have two, uh, uh, Adelphi Foresight 2, uh, because we need to, to understand which is the possibility of the innovations diffusion, the expectations of the agents. This is, uh, these are the, our, our three uh, dimensions, yeah? the physical and material conditions indicators, the attributes of community that can uh, make a, a, the learning process to, to make uh, some, some new, new actions, some, new, some adoptions of innovations in order to have uh, sustainable food systems. And finally, I'm, I'm at the, the end of my presentation. This is our partner, the government secretary of agriculture of uh, the state of Sao Paulo. And this is a, a platform of uh, selling and buying products, uh, agricultural products. And uh, these two will be part of this platform. Yeah. And the last two slides, uh, how to realize. This is uh, the social impact expected. It's a foresight. Uh, approach. Uh, we, we, we aim to ge the, the generation of a, a large accountability network, because if you do not have a new rational to, to decision making how to produce, what to produce, and why to produce in sustainable terms, it's not uh, an effective um, way to, to to reach the, the so-called um, uh, transition, yeah? It's, uh, for uh, and it, it's uh, an accent impact planning. So we have been constructing, forming a stakeholders and shareholders and policymaker interaction, not only for the designing for the indicators, but now for the, the use, the, uh, a very broad use of this too. It's a public choice approach, yeah? Uh, we need to create situation arenas in which we can have capacity building for decision making. So that's it, networking that involves public and private sector, more than 40 institutions to expand uh, this kind of arenas and to share sustainability indicators as a manner, as a, a way in which we can have a future transition governance and policy making. Thank you very much. This is my contact. Thank you so much, Esther and uh, Daniel for, for presenting the uh, waste fuel project. I think this project shows very well how um, the sushi projects or how projects um, funded by, by JPI or Europe and partly also by the Belmont Fund bring together different actors um, and different different stakeholders really to to co-create and bring together knowledges and have a, a discussion um, on um, yeah really distilling common topics and then take it further it it, it shows that very well um, I think we can take questions maybe at the end when we have the discussion round so far there's not a question coming in via Zoom yet I believe. Um, then we would, right jump, would jump right into the next set of presentations. Um, that is the Creating Interfaces project, which addresses capacity building for the urban food, water, energy nexus, making food, water, energy linkages understandable to the stakeholders and facilitating cooperation and knowledge exchange among them. So with us today is uh, Bia Labon from the uh, European Institute for Energy Research and Joanna Suchomska from PSIDAR Sustainable Development Laboratory in Torun, who will tell us more about their projects, uh, project creating interfaces. The floor is yours. Okay. Um... Can you see the right presentation? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation to present today. So um, yes, I'm Pierre Bonnier, sociologist at the European in Energy Research Institute in Karlsruhe. And together with Joanna Sochomska, we would like to give you some insights how we tackle the uh, subject or the task of knowledge co-creation and on the food water energy nexus on the urban level in the budget creating interfaces. Um, 
we are an inter- and transdisciplinary team in different countries in Europe and in, also in the US. And um, our aims are capacity building for the food, water, energy nexus um, to create science citizen policy interfaces, interfaces both in the sense of social interfaces and technical interfaces, to foster knowledge exchange and cooperation among local stakeholders on the food, water, energy nexus, to develop and test approaches for local knowledge, co-creation and participation, to enhance the visibility of the food, water, energy nexus, so it's both about <clears throat> so it's both about knowledge building and also methodology development and testing. Um, we do this in three um, living labs in Wilmington, US, Slupsk in Poland, and Tulcza in Romania. So all these cities are mid-sized cities, and. Um, there are some challenges regarding Nexus research in cities. So there's a limited number of studies that capture the full spectrum of the food, water, energy at urban scale. There's a lack of data and tools that help understand and visualize Nexus within existing governance structures. There's also limited knowledge and experience on public participation in Nexus governance. And last but not least, it's a complex concept so the food, water, energy nexus, and there's need for translation and for explaining. So when going to the to the ground, to the cities, to local stakeholders, yeah, normally they don't know this, and it's not so easy to relate to it. So that's a challenge for um, living lives. The expected impacts um, we have, I focus now on the local level, so it's, we, we foster networking and also the visibility of needs, ideas, initiatives, and um, want to foster the integration of bottom-up approaches in local governance. So we, we foster awareness and knowledge regarding the food, water, energy nexus, and, and also knowledge on the potentials for sustainability governance. And we think perhaps it can also increase efficiency of local sustainability strategies. Um, we increase knowledge on local knowledge co-creation and participation. So we create experiences on this in different contexts. So it's about, yeah, we, we do capacity building in cities. And um, I think it's the key impact is it's quite difficult to measure, but still it's really important. It's about... Um, foster changes in thinking and, and local practice. So main aspects regarding how to, to realize these impacts are to engage stakeholders from the beginning of the project on, even in the um, definition of the projects of the questions, and then to build on real local needs, like um, really link to problems important for local communities as starting point and then to focus the attention or to, to explain the, the um, links with the other um, elements, with the other su subsystems. And um, one, one key point is to learn and adjust during the whole project. We had also to adjust some things um, like, like um, in Wilmington, the, the key focus. Um, and to, to work on, on this translation, on visualization. Um, our approach to do Nexus research locally is to start with one food, water, energy Nexus element and then build a connection, connection to the other elements. So in Slopes, we started from food supply in Wilmington from community energy and climate resilience. We adapted this later on in the project because we saw that um, accessibility, accessibility to, to food was the much more urgent um, topic and we could will link this. Then in Tulcha, the, the starting point was water and um, more specifically irrigation systems for gardening. So in, in this gardening topic and irrigation, the nexus were, was the most easily visible somehow. And then we, we started to, to um, try to understand the nexus connections and exploring potentials for nexus governance and current structures also in the local context. 
And we relate to an urban living lab approach, um, defining urban living labs as intentional collaborative experimentation of researchers, citizens, companies, and local governments. To give you some concrete examples how we tackle this um, working or doing knowledge co-creation on the Nexus, um, we did, for example, um, we, so the, the core pillars were um, local workshops or our local workshops. And we did, for example, um, participatory modeling exercises. You can see on the picture, it's it's quite um, traditional with post-its and poster and to, to, but really to focus on the links and it worked quite well. Then the next step was to put this in a qualitative model. And um, it's, it's supposed to support the co-creation of common understanding of interdependencies and also like um, conflicts and to visualize this. Um, then the next was um, our colleagues in the US and at the ENCA, they did uh, nice story maps and dashboards um, based on the local data we acquired. And um, then what we also did is a co-creation of a citizen science tool. It was quite a long process because we started with talking to the stakeholders, what could be interesting. Then we showed mock-ups and discussed functionalities, uh, possible questions in the workshops went back to the stakeholders, to our um, uh, colleagues, our partners who are doing really this technical things, 52 North, and yeah, in an iterative process. And now um, I hand over to Joanna to explain this more in detail in Slupsk. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Joanna. Uh, I'm from Torun, from um, NGOs, um, and I am a local coordination of our cooperation with um, Swupsk City. Uh, so the Swupsk City is one of the cities that we cooperate in our project. Um, this is a medium-sized industrial city in Poland, uh, which plays an um, important role of a regional trade center and supra-regional cultural center also. And there is an important military garnison and uh, this is, yeah, this, the Swoops city is here. Uh, this is a red pin on the map. Um, yes, yeah, so um, uh, as you can see, uh, this is a um, city which is really close to, uh, to the Baltic uh, Sea. Okay, next, next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. And now I, I will try to, um, I will try to say uh, say something more about how our approach in uh, in the project uh, works in practice. Uh, so, uh, as Pia said before, uh, in Swupsk um, we got um, we cooperate in Swupsk City City Hall, and our starting point here it is um, food it is food and um, especially food supply in kindergartens. Uh, the Swupsk city don't have a big experience um, in management of food, but a um, few years ago they introduced um, their own rules for public uh, kindergartens nutrition, uh, such as, for example, um, not using salt or sugar or sugar and trying to cooperate with uh, local food uh, producers. So we uh, we decided that it could be a um, good starting point to uh, to uh, cooperate um, on the local level, especially with uh, with citizens. And in our case, in this case, we cooperate closely with uh, two kindergartens. Okay, the next slide, please. Uh, yes. Um, so. Um, we start our work in Swoopsk with uh, from local diagnosis. So we conduct online survey with parents, and then we organized a local workshop with key stakeholders, for example, with headmasters of kindergartens and key um, headmasters of departments from City Hall. 
And after that, we organized our first URL workshop where we discussed um, needs and ideas, um, which is connected with um, food system, food management, but also uh, food from the uh, really practice um, point of view of the citizens. Um, yes, and um, uh, after this uh, uh, this workshop, we we use all of, of data and needs that we gather and prepared our uh, our IT tool. And now we are um, we finished our uh, testing uh, phase um, using the tool, um, and uh, we 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 will go to. Um, to prepare some kind of visualization tool um, to, to, to emphasize the, the Nexus links. Um, and we will discuss uh, all of our results on the second URL workshops. Okay, the next. Uh, yes, what was important for us, um, it is, um, really uh, uh, it is really needs uh, what uh, what is what was important for the citizens and especially for the parents if we talk about uh, food and as you can see on this chart um, on this graph um, for almost almost half of the respondents the quality of food in kindergartens was the most important or very important issue uh, and what is the most important when we, when they talk about food in kindergarten, it was that the food should be healthy and varied and, um, uh, and also suitable for the children age. So as you can see, uh, the ecological or organic issue, it isn't very important for them. But uh, we have to remember that the Nexus concept is strong relation also to the healthy, uh, to the health. So uh, it was a good uh, starting point to go further with this concept for us. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, uh, so um, we, uh, after this uh, online survey, we, we discuss, uh, we discuss all of the issue with citizens uh, during the world workshops. Okay, the next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and on this slide, I put the mine uh, needs for an online online tool, uh, which we gather during the, the workshop. So people want to um, will more uh, better informed about local food and suppliers. And for example, they uh, for sure they, they need more information about food in nurseries, kindergartens and school, for example, about the menus, uh, information about the origin of the products. And they want to also uh, give their feedback about the food. Uh, interesting thing, it was also a uh, healthy nutrition and um, information about how to avoid food waste and, for example, exchange information about that, what Swoopsk residents like to eat. Okay, so it was our yeah, uh, inspiration uh, for that, how to, uh, how to tackle, how to improve it, how to use this data, this, these needs in our online tool. Okay, yes. Um, so this is our online tool. Uh, it is um, map based with local producers and kindergartens. Okay, can we go on? Hmm. Uh, and during the testing phase, parents received information about what their children ate um, and ba with basic information about, for example, calories, allergies, uh, and origin of products, um, what they, which they used to prepare these meals. Okay, can we, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and they could together, uh, they, they was um, invited to 
um, to evaluate uh, the meals uh, and they uh, had to do this together with their children uh, and for example they could answer to the question do you think this uh, this meal was healthy for your children it was good or not and uh, something like that okay the next slide please uh, so now uh, we are uh, working on our visualization tool uh, to um, emphasize the nexus in Swoopsk case. Uh, so we introduced the in visualization tool to show better connection uh, between nexus elements. Uh, so as you can see, we, uh, we want to uh, Say something about food, something more about uh, about food and their connection with water and energy, for example. Okay, the next slide. Yeah, and uh, for example, here we can compare different dishes from the kindergarten. Uh, yeah, to make um, yeah, and to compare, for example, the waste foods, the calories, the energy the um, water uh, needs to prepare this kind of uh, this kind of meal and we can in in a very simple way uh, say which kind of uh, which kind of meal it's um, it's for it's better for the next yeah <laughs> okay the next slide so uh, our conclusion from the swoops case is the is that the ecological ecological aspects and um, of food and the food water energy relationship are not the most important for parents but um, what is important that um, we have to consider the needs and agree with them and um, the needs, the citizens' needs, this, it should be our starting point to thinking wider about the connection with, um, with Nexus. Uh, secondly, um, for kindergarten managers, uh, this is important to show that they care about good nutrition of children. And this is also important for parents. But we think that um, Nexus perspective uh, can, uh, can be one of the elements uh, of responsible nutrition and we can show, uh, show this. And the parents and kindergarten managers need a step-by-step -step introduction to, uh, to the food, water, energy nexus issue. We know that uh, this concept is invisible and so we need um, to, to show the nexus in a better way and uh, we know that our role as experts is important uh, in implementation of ideas of the local level. Okay, so yeah, and the last slide. Uh, this is our general uh, conclusion from, uh, yeah, from our experience in this project. Uh, so we can say that Nexus concept is difficult to, co to, to communicate locally. Uh, so we really need to find ways to make it better visible and understandable. And uh, for example, um, what could help us, it is uh, really focus on uh, local, um, local needs and um, local communities. Uh, yeah, for example, choosing a starting point uh, and to go further with, uh, with them. Uh, and uh, we should also uh, focus on everyday practices, um, which um, uh, yeah, which could be also a good starting point. Um, what is important and what is interesting uh, for uh, from our um, our perspective is that um, this concept of food, water, energy nexus also. Uh, for sure could overcoming silos thinking and enhancing exchange and cooperation of different local actors. It is real, it is huge problem in uh, not only in Swoopsk, but also in our other cities uh, in our project uh, that managing uh, it's very silos 
uh, but the Nexus uh, approach uh, could be very useful for changes in governments. Okay, so thank you very much for attention. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jana and uh, Pia for introducing the Creating Interfaces project. Um, if you have any, or if the participants have any questions directed to P and Joanna, or also to, to Daniel or Esther, please just put them in the chat. We will, now is the time, we will go into a discussion round with uh, the speakers of today. We will have about, yeah, 20 minutes left for that. I will also start with uh, sharing um, the Menti one more time. And what came from the participant? What came in from the participants? So we also asked how could approaches on food, water, energy nexus be useful for tackling urban challenges? And there was uh, um, responses to reduce carbon footprint and food waste, network building, increased mobility, integrated planning better view from global perspective and not just isolated elements and so on. There were a couple which I would like to take out now for the discussion. For example, um, where is it coming? This one, overcoming silo management. Uh, um, I, I guess this means silo, uh, thinking and silo management, enhancing collaboration. That is something what you also mentioned, Joanna. And I was wondering if our panelists would like to reflect upon this uh, contribution here. What are your experiences from the project and how, how did you address these, um, these issues in, uh, in your projects? The floor is open, so please just uh, start addressing the question, whoever has some thought on that. Johannes, I'm not a project, but I would like to definitely support that statement. Um, that working together to uh, address a system is critical, that no one understands all elements and uh, we're stronger together. So if we can um, build ideas together and understand how all of the elements interact, um, you know, we will come up with a much more um, uh, feasible solution, but also one that everyone is more likely to accept because they were part of the solution finding process. Thank you, Erica. Um, is there someone else who wants to, to address this? Daniel, yes, you raise your hand. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, this is a perennial challenge. Um, so we, we took the view when we developed our bid that it would be better to have, um, uh, because obviously you, you can divide up the, the funding in, in a number of different ways, and we thought it'd be better to have more voices um, spread out. Um, I mean, there are challenges with that because you, you have a larger coordination um, uh, and you need the resource to be able to do that. But at the same time, it does give you uh, a number of different voices to feed into that, which is critically important. I mean, even though it's three systems out of many other systems, um, there are plenty of complexities uh, in and around those various different systems. So, um, but I think that the nature of the program is inherently seeks to overcome that, that solo thinking. So, um, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Jonas, you raised your hand before I give you the word. I would um, like to follow up with a question for you, um, uh, Esther and Daniel. I, I, want to, I would be interested in how did this project, um, or what did you learn by this uh, cross-Atlantic uh, collaboration in terms of overcoming this uh, silo uh, approaches or overcoming this? Was there something, something you could um, 
exchange on from or, or learn from different uh, approaches in the UK and in that case, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, maybe you could think about that a little. Jonas, you raised your hand. May I? So, uh, so is that first Jonas and then I give you the, the word. Yeah. All right, yeah, thanks. Um, now, I was also looking at this uh, around, um, I'd say, silo dynamics, I almost said solo dynamics now, it would be wrong. Um, and, 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 and I think as Erika is also on too, um, well, there, there seems to be, and I was also listen, listening to um, the creating interfaces when you were saying that we really also need some kind of uh, visualization of these rather complex systemic aspects, right, today. Th this is kind of a, a one big aspect of why it's also very difficult probably to work with this. And, and, and looking at silo effects, silo dynamics, et cetera, um, maybe I, I was thinking if uh, what we're starting to think about as strategic syntheses, that, that is working with knowledge integration between different types of knowledge and not just different types of silo or, or let's say disciplinary knowledge or um, technical areas, but also between, let's say, professional academic knowledge formalizations and layperson everyday life and practitioner, et cetera, right? The, these, they can be quite different and it can be quite difficult in transdisciplinary co-creative situations to, um, how would you say, uh, do it justice? So, so I was just wondering if, if this might be something that we should push a lot more looking at increasing, supporting developments around this. And this is partly visualization, partly, I don't know what kinds of forms this might take, but to work more with knowledge integration from that point of view. Thank you, Jonas. Coming back to, to Daniel and Esther, to the question from before, where, you have some takes on this overcoming the silo. What um, what were the learnings across the Atlantic in your project on that? Esther, yeah. you wanted to yeah. Say, yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, um, we have been assuming that uh, it's not uh, enough to have uh, uh, great networks of uh, stakeholders and knowledge uh, uh, holders. <laughs> Uh, it's necessary to, to create a new cognitive rules pattern among uh, a lot of people, a lot of uh, policymakers and knowledge creators as uh, academics, and especially uh, among producers. So the, uh, this network has to be thought not only as a group of of persons or people in, in, in their relations, but we have to, to use some tool in which you can have a, a universal, it's a, it's a philosophical approach, yeah? in which people uh, now are able to choose another, another set of conditions to produce, to, to commercialize and to consume. Yeah, that's the approach of São Paulo, uh, São Paulo Yuba well. Uh, it's not a short-term challenge, uh, of course. Thank you, Esther. Are there some more reflections or comments at this stage? Okay, then let's maybe go to the next slide. Here we also uh, ask the participants if they have any questions or comments to the speakers. Um, and I think this is a very interesting one also in this, uh, in this especially in this context uh, of this webinar where we, which we organize between the JPI um, Europe and uh, Enrich and LAC. So where it's, um, where we discuss a lot about um, what can be learned across contexts, how uh, can one um, approach be um, 
translated into another urban context on another continent. So the, here the question is, how can these approaches be implemented in cities, urban areas of the global south? And I would really like to uh, put that question forward to you, Pia and Joanna. What do you think, what can be learned from your project and how, what can be learned uh, from, from creating interfaces in the global south? One immediate thing is, of course, how, yeah, how to communicate on the on the nexus, how to make these linkages understandable. But um, I think it's it's difficult because it's very very context specific. But on the other hand, I think the tools can be used in different contexts or or this. Um, yeah, this different thinking of bringing different knowledge together. What what Jonas also mentioned, not only the silos regarding the nexus elements, but all or the but also the silence regarding different knowledge systems. And I think that's something that can be um, implemented in very different contexts. So this um, principle of doing this. And regarding the, the, the uh, overcoming the silos, um, it was already what we saw, it was in all three contexts, we had already a step to bring these people together. And yeah, Joanna, perhaps you can also. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the most important is to, to find the, the good starting point. Yeah, you, you really have to uh, think about the, the most important problem and uh, yeah, bring together together people uh, who who are um, who are uh, responsible for, for this. Uh, but this is something universal. Yeah, it isn't uh, uh, something um, very important only for the south cities. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, but but this is something universal, I think. Uh, yeah, and very important issue is that um, nexus should be closer to um, to citizens. Yeah, because at the moment this is uh, this is quite um, quite easier to uh, to talk about the, that uh, with. For, for example, institutions, but still we need to think about that, how to uh, implement this concept to, uh, to the citizens. And for example, the visualization tools could, uh, could help with communication with people. Hmm? What, I, what I hear a little bit between the lines, what you, what you just said, um, is that it's more about the learning might, might not happen at the, at the, from the result of the project, but from the approach of the project, which it takes, which I think is a very interesting take because it also relates to overcoming the silo thinking. And since both of your projects uh, introduce urban living labs, I think um, that, that, uh, that, that's something I, I heard from, from both of your comments from pro both projects. Yes, and of course it's a big challenge because uh, we need time to to tackle with this. Yeah, we need mm -hmm. uh, we need a long time. It uh, it doesn't happen during one year. Yeah, and during our project, but uh, yeah, I uh, I'm sure that we we start some some changes mm -hmm. in, in our cities in, from our mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Beana, you raise your hand. Yes, I mean, uh, I will, uh, I'm not sure if I understood your question or if I have my own uh, answers, regardless of your question, and not coming from specifically from the urban uh, urbanization field, but more, you know, generic approach we have in the project is I think so far based on our experience, especially when we want to um, establish collaboration on the thematic levels, I think the first step, it may sound very uh, you know, simple to you, but the need must be acknowledged on, on both sides. So there, there is a need 
for collaboration. So if one side pushes, if one side says, look, we have very good solutions for your problem, it doesn't work, even if, uh, you know, no matter how hard they try. So I think this, um, you know, this, this joint um, agreement on the needs are, are really the key. And following to that, um, uh, again, based on our own experience, a good local, um, local meaning can be regional or national or at the city level, a kind of a organization who, who takes it and who, who works on it and who tries to create awareness in their, in their own community first and at the national level or at the regional level. This is also very important. Um, so this is also linked to the need and how, how it affects their lives as a citizen or as a public employee or as a researcher, however you take it. I think these two, when we have these two, international cooperation, co uh, collaboration comes a lot easier because they're going to look for solutions. They're going to look for good examples. Uh, so to, to learn, of course, some examples are not uh, immediately transferable, uh, but at least uh, kind of the initial um, steps will be achieved when we have these two. And then of course, platforms like ours can um, um, kind of serve to create this uh, awareness on the good practice examples, what is going on in different parts of the world, urbanization cannot be localized into one country or region. It is a problem uh, or sustainable development is a problem for the whole, whole world. So uh, different pl platforms can, can share their knowledge and keep this on the agenda of, of not only the policymakers, but also individuals uh, who will benefit at the end from, from all these collaborations. Uh, that's what I wanted to uh, say. <laughs> Thank you, Bernard. Then I would uh, put that question or the, this, this question a bit forward to Jonas and Erika. What can be done on the research funding side um, um, to, to address that and to, to allow these learnings? Um, Erica, I was waiting for you to start, I, but we can tag team if you want. <laughs> um, well, looking at learning, uh, I, I think we tend tend to to um, how would you say go about it from more of a systemic perspective and capacity building among different types of actors. In a, in a conceptual way, uh, I guess that's one way we can try to find, fund um, in, in this way, of, especially when you have urban governance involved in different ways, right? That, that's, at least for JPA Urban Europe, that has been kind of a, um, a rather big thing. But there, I guess there might also be other programming activities that we can kind of... Uh, work in between larger calls if because if we just have call, calls for projects yes then we will have we will probably learn a lot about learning dynamics right in these situations but we might also want to how do you say work in 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 the urban innovation ecosystem so to speak <laughs> that is you <laughs> all of you out there more or less i mean uh, across the globe in different ways we have been doing something similar to training sessions, Johannes and I, and in, in when we are using results from, from projects and, and inviting participants from different practitioner fields in, at conferences, for example, and having a longer session where we, we're sitting down and we're looking at how, what, what do you need to know? How do you need to prepare? What do you need to expect to try to learn or something around urban living labs, for example? Right, so so th there are several ways, and I, I leave it over, uh, over to you, Erika. Do you have any more more concrete and less confusing <laughs> points? <laughs> no, I I mean I think every funding activity that we do, we learn from. Um, we've definitely um, come to appreciate in Belmont Forum uh, the need to use a number of different tools. Um, funding tools and um, valorization training uh, 
um, networking, um, the power of bringing projects together. So not just in the Suji Nexus, but like in this venue today, bringing those projects together with projects in Latin America and the Caribbean, you know, that is a knowledge transfer there. Um, we then need to catalyze that into an opportunity to act and learn together on that sharing. And hopefully that's what we'll be doing with the sustainable consumption and production call is building on this. Um, we can fund uh, network development, capacity building, um, synthesis, um, the research projects themselves. And we can work with other types of funders and uh, philanthropies and uh, foundations who um, may not have a merit review process, but they're able to fund post-award activity. So looking at the legacy and the transformation that sometimes doesn't happen in that three to five years and um, capturing the deep impact and the social transformation that takes place. So we really, we all work in an ecosystem. There's a, a research ecosystem, there's an implementation ecosystem, there's a political ecosystem. From the resource side, we have a number of connections that can help support the full spectrum. And we just have to work together and build those relationships to make that possible. Very good, thank you so much, Erica. Pia. Um, yes, if I could also do a, a, a remark, a wish for the funding side, um, I think it would be great somehow to, to promote coordination partnerships between research and practice and really to, to um, yeah, that the coordination is done together and to, to ensure or enhance ownership on the projects, a shared ownership, I think that would be really great. And also like to enable direct um, sharing of experiences, also of practice partners. And then also to give some, some support like for the sustaining of initiatives of things that have been um, initiated locally. And also of, of the yeah, of the sharing of experiences of this networking. And it would be great if the researchers could come back after some time and come back to the local level and see what has come about. Or, yeah, what are the impacts and to learn also then for further projects or initiatives. That would be great from this funding side. Thank you, Pia. Are there some more comments from the speakers? Yeah, Daniel? Yes, please, I would like Esther? to only yeah. to make a comment um, about uh, Erica's speech. Last, uh, uh, Erica, and you know, we, we have a lot of split, yeah? Especially in uh, developing countries like mine. Uh, in which we, we have uh, a lot of funding for science and technology and knowledge production and knowledge sharing. But nowadays in Brazil specifically, my big problem is that the funding for innovation diffusion, yeah, because we have, we have been searching and selecting innovations, new technologies for sustainable food production. But we do not have nowadays a good scenario for funding for R&D and especially for innovation adoption and diffusion. This is the main problem for us. Yeah. Well, of course, in knowledge uh, production generation is always a problem, but uh, uh, the the mode, the it's a big mode between um, to have new technologies for sustainable food systems and to to offer them for the producers. Uh, at, at the same time for, for uh, food waste or plastics waste in the urban uh, post-production sectors, yeah. I would like to talk to, to this uh, with my funding agency, yeah. That's why I have been, I, I would like to comment with you too. 
I do not know if in Europe you have such a situation. Johannes, would you like me to respond or? Yes, very briefly before we yeah. go to, to Daniel who, who raised his hand already a while ago. Sure, apologies. Yeah. I, I just wanna say you have excellent timing uh, because we have been talking about this, the last mile, the uh, readiness of the technology, the adoption, the social acceptance, and looking at this uh, innovation in a system perspective, since we are working in the nexus. Um, so we plan on having uh, an event about this with funders um, and with um, examples at the SRI Congress. So uh, once we finalize the details, we will um, make that information public so that uh, hopefully you can connect and we can explore. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Daniel. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the big challenges that we've been facing on our various projects is, is you know, and I sort of alluded to it earlier on, when, when you are pulling together many, many different uh, researchers as well as different practitioners, there are uh, a number of different, uh, well, it's the, the coordination factor is a, is a big factor. And um, quite often here in the UK, uh, my experience at least is that it's not, it's not always recognized because it quite often sits in, in the background. It's sort of, it's management. Um, and if you are seeking to do something that is truly dan transdisciplinary and it's, and it's trying to bring all these people together in a, in a constructive way, it, it does require greater, um, greater resource and it's difficult to make the case to do that. Unfortunately, um, I think there is a danger as well that it can just turn into a, lots, of, lots of academics talking and not a lot happening. Um, and so I think maybe the, it has to come in combination with a, a really strong focus on impact and outcomes. Um, and this is something that's gaining a lot of traction in the UK at the moment, particularly with funders. We have our research excellence framework is about, um, is, is starting to highlight this increasingly. Um, and obviously there's work by people like Mariana Mutsukata looking at mission-oriented research and, and things like that. So um, yeah, it's an interesting new area and it would be interesting to hear from funders actually what their thinking is on that, on that area. Thank you. I have a feeling we're getting a, a bit too far off the food, water, energy nexus here. Um, but if you have any comments or questions, I'm, I'm pretty sure Jonas and Erika are uh, available via email to, to sort these, these things out or just give us, in the, at least in the JPI or Europe, input uh, on these thoughts because we are, we are at the moment yeah, co-designing our, our next program for the next seven years and any input for that is welcome. I would say um, we are almost through with the time. I um, thank you so much, all the speakers, the panelists, to share their insight, their experiences from the Suchi knowledge, uh, from the Suchi projects. Uh, Erica, thank you so much for uh, for attending this webinar and giving your insights here. Jonas, uh, thank you so much too. Um, Anna. I would like to give the word to you to, to have some, what are, what are your takes from that, uh, that discussion? How does that uh, feed into, into what you're doing in, in, in Rich and Luck? And uh, do you want to, to reflect on that a little? Yes, of course. It actually um, overlaps with our plans uh, for the future. As I mentioned before, the sustainable urbanization is one of the five thematic pr priorities of the Energy and Luck Initiative in the next three years. And uh, we will collaborate with European, international, regional, and national networks and organizations uh, at, from the policymaker levels to the researcher levels uh, to support learning from each other, um, to make the good examples more visible, and to bring researchers funder, uh, namely the innovation agencies, as well as businesses together who look for innovative solutions and who can actually offer those solutions. And I really hope that um, our efforts will contribute to uh, EU luck collaboration and more sustainable future 
for all. Thank you. Thank you, Verna. And also, thank you, everybody who joined this, this webinar. Uh, so I had a, I, I monitored the participants over the last two, uh, almost two hours. And I think uh, in, in, in a time where there's uh, a lot of webinars going on, having uh, over 100 participants on Zoom and, and uh, YouTube combined is pretty good. So thank you so much uh, for joining. I hope we, we could provide a interesting program. Let us know what you think of this program. Uh, I put my email address in the, in, the, in the chat. Feel free to connect. And thank you so much again. And let's stay in touch. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Have a nice evening, day, Bye. morning. <laughs>